Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities, and I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour. This is actually the inauguration of the Medical Center Hour's 42nd season. Um, our program is produced by the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine. This venerable medicine and society forum actually originated in the late 1960s initiated by former medical school dean, Dr. Tom Hunter, and visiting ethicist, Joseph Fletcher. The two of them liked nothing better than sparking brisk, multidisciplinary debate about big picture issues that were facing doctors, patients, policymakers, and the public. In 1971, the Medical Center Hour went from being an occasional series to a week in, week out, regular event for the medical school, the hospitals and clinics, the university, and importantly, the wider community. We're grateful for the School of Medicine's support these four plus decades now. And we're also very grateful for you, our audience, for your presence and importantly, for your contributions to the 20 plus programs that we will bring you this year. Please remember that these are your programs, you're our partners in this enterprise, and your voices and views are vital. We count on hearing from you always in the closing minutes of the hour. So, welcome to all of you. We begin this new year with the Medical School's Alpha Omega Alpha Lecture, an annual presentation that's organized and sponsored by UVA's chapter of the National Honor Med Medical Honor Society, Alpha Omega Alpha. This year's presentation, Odyssey of a Physician Scientist, Gliding Through the Golden Years, features the distinguished physician scientist Aaron Vinnick from the Eastern Virginia Medical School in Norfolk. Dr. Vinnick is professor of medicine, pathology, and neurobiology at EVMS. He directs the research and neuroendocrine unit of the Stroelitz Diabetes Center for Endocrine and Metabolic Disorders there. He's had a phenomenal career studying and testing regeneration of pancreatic islet cells and nerve fibers. As he'll tell us, his career represents everything that a physician scientist's life can be. Promising, exploratory, laborious, risky, turbulent, lucky, meticulous, exciting, and rewarding. His career path also traces some of the same trajectory as this most recent half century's golden years of biomedical and clinical research in the US. He'll share with us today some of the lessons he's learned along the way about discovery, collaboration, being mentored, and as Ralph Waldo Emerson suggested, about venturing where there's no path and leaving a trail for the next generation to follow. We'd like especially to welcome our AOA visiting professor, Aaron Pinnock. We'd like to thank AOA and especially Margaret Lynch, who made arrangements for the visit and the presentation. And we should thank AOA also because I think there are some light refreshments being provided outside after the program. Welcome, Dr. Bennett. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Childers, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, with all those words, I think, are there any questions now? <laughs> I want to thank you. I want to thank the members of the AOA. I want to thank in particular Peggy Lynch, who's sitting up there for making the arrangements of being such a wonderful hostess. I also want to thank Mark Mendelssohn who's sitting up there too uh, for uh, the um, dessert that we had last night and the members of the uh, Endocrine Society uh, for my visit to them and doing endocrine grand rounds yesterday. So uh, for me being a physician scientist, and some of us think physician scientists are a dying breed, it's really exciting for me to share with you so some of the things that have happened during the course of my life. I think I've, I've had a wonderful time doing that, and uh, I've uh, met with wonderful people, I've learned from wonderful people, and um, uh, hopefully I will have left an indelible mark on some people somewhere in the world uh, as it's transpired. So today I want to talk to you about gliding through these golden years, the life of a physician scientist. I want to share with you some of the excitement in my life uh, as a physician scientist. I will talk to you about the discovery of the ability to regenerate pancreatic islets. When I started my career, I was told that could never happen. When I first made the discovery with my team, they told us we were heretics, and now everybody's saying it's possible. 
Okay. Yeah, it's a really nice place to be. I want to talk to you about the recognition of what can be done for nerve damage. There are two cells in the human body, the beta cell and the pancreas. We told it never regenerates. And we were told peripheral nervous system, the nerves never regenerate. Now I'm going to tell you, as a heretic, we challenged the, the dogma and we approved the dogma wrong. And that's where we were going to go. Even nerves can be enticed to regenerate under the appropriate circumstances. And then, uh, I'm going to finish off quickly, and, and I'll try. If you hear me speeding up when I'm talking to you, it's because my time is running out. But I do want to share with you what, the, what it's been like to have a partner accompany you on this road to discovery. And uh, some of the things that we've managed to do. I know, don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at Gail Sheehy's article, or in the book, this is in the inside cover of the book, The New Map of Adult Life. So when we started up, uh, up my career over here, this over here was the tryout 20s when I went to medical school. Okay. So we tried out, and I told my father when I got to second year, which was I was doing physiology at that time, that Dad, I don't want to do any more of this medical school stuff. Yeah, I said, I want to go and do the science. It's much more interesting. And he said to me, son, I'm paying for you. You're going to finish medical school. Then you can do what you like. So that is exactly what I had to do. I had to finish medical school, qualify as a physician, then go back and do the science uh, uh, as it was. And uh, then we, I got into the turbulent 30s, the flourishing 40s, and then the flaming 50s. And that's when I came from South Africa to the United States. And I had to start all over again. To say, my chairman of medicine, Bill Kelly at the University of Michigan, said to me, how many papers you published? And I said, 50. He said, well, now it's zero and you will start again. Because we don't believe anything you said from Cape Town, South Africa. We consider that to be the necrotic tip of Africa, and soon it's going to fall <laughs> off the top. And now you will start afresh. So I just started afresh. I, you know, I don't have to tell you how many papers I've published in the United States. But, and now I'm, we're into the serene 60s. And, and uh, you know, if you look at the... Uh, uh, there's a sailboat there. I love to sail. I love to windsurf over there. It says over here that you, we can take active risks at this point in time. There's not a lot that we can really lose. We have grandchildren at stake, and they are wonderful to nurture. And it says we're in the sexual diamond of our careers when we're in, in this period of time. So isn't that a wonderful place to be? So that's where we are now, in, in that period. So how did my career actually start? I worked with Bill Hoffenberg, who is no longer alive, but he was knighted for his contributions on endocrine exophthalmia. Uh, and uh, he was extradited from South Africa. I wrote my PhD's thesis, the final paragraphs, sitting on suitcases at his house when he was being extradited by the police to get out of the country because he'd stirred the country against the apartheid policy. And that's you know, what I began. I learned one important thing in life. If you're going to succeed at anything, choose a good mentor. I didn't really have to choose him. I was working with him uh, in the department. And this is what he taught me. Do you see this uh, look at uh, looking but not seeing? Do you see what line we <laughs> see? That's what so many of us do today. We don't look at people. We don't listen to people. We don't even take their clothes off to examine them at all. So, I, I mean, I, I hate the notion that that's where we've come in life. So, I saw this patient in clinic. Um, who wasn't quite um, as, as uh, steely-eyed as the patient here, but I couldn't find a picture of her, so I, I got this picture to show you. And she'd been referred to us by Andre Swanepoel, who was a superb clinician, and said, she's hypothyroid, and I'd like you to treat her. And I examined her, and she was clinically good thyroid. And then I took her to Bill Hoffenberg, who had been knighted for his work on thyroid disease, and I said, look at this patient with me. He said, oh, there's nothing wrong with her. Then I took it to Bernard Pinso, one of my other colleagues in endocrine body. I said, would you mind looking at this patient? And they looked at the patient. They said, oh, there's nothing wrong with her. I said, I want to show you something. This patient came in, and she, was, she wasn't perspiring. She wasn't shaky. She wasn't jumpy. Nothing of the features that you see in hypothyroid. I said, did Dr. Swanepoel give you anything? And she put out her hand. She gave me this little pink pole. That little pink pole was in the round. Inneral is a beta-adrenergic system blocker. The major features of hypothyroidism is activation of the adrenergic nervous system. It was all blocked 
by this little bow. That, ladies and gentlemen, was my first discovery. I was sitting to the patient, having her show me the pull that she'd taken, and this was the first paper on sympathetic nervous system blocking in hypothyroidism with it. So what Goethe said was Zygmunt Weissmann, which means what you know you will see, what you don't know you will never see unless you keep your eyes open. And so this was an important lesson for me at the beginning. So now let's move on to aging. There are only two ways to go about it. Gracefully versus poorly. Okay. And so we want to talk about, here is uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. As a young chap, Arnold was fit and in shape. But as time wore on, he did not keep up his defined physique, as you see here. Mostly, definitely an example of aging poorly. There is now. That may be, you know, having been governor of California, that he had to put up with so many tribulations. The other is that uh, there are many ways to go about keeping young as you get older. Uh, plastic surgery should have been one of them. But of course, that's not what we think of when we want to grow older gracefully. Many of us, as we get older, we think we're just as groovy as ever. And uh, hopefully, we behave that way. But people begin to think of us as being a, a little nutty. I was in Antwerp when I saw uh, this sculpture in the garden. And I thought it was an incredible thing. This is a picture of Pegasus, uh, the horse over here, drawing the carriage with Icarus on his, embarking on his journey to the sun. The person you see in the back of the carriage over there is his distraught mother, who says, Icarus, my dear son, do not go on this journey to the sun. Your wings are made of wax and they will melt and you'll come crashing down. So what did I do? I embarked on a journey to the sun. And I took my chances with pancreatic beta cells. We were told, when I was a student, beta cells would never ever regenerate. Right? And we were told, because I came from Cape Town, South Africa, one of the highest areas of alcohol-induced pancreatitis, and uh, secondary diabetes, that once you drank too much. You could either bite the pancreas or lick the liver, or bite the liver and lick the pancreas. But if you killed off a beta cell, you lost it, and it never regenerated. So there's a loss of beta cell mass in diabetes with resistance to the action of insulin in type 2 diabetes. And in type 1 diabetes, there's autoimmune disruption of the beta cell mass. Uh, and, and why don't we? we simply regenerate, because we're told it can't be done. We don't regenerate. So here is the issue. If you look at the mechanisms of reduction of islet mass, in the pancreas you saw no acid and tissue, which makes all the enzymes. And here is an islet stained with an antibody to insulin. So you see insulin in the center. Those are the islets, about a million islets in a pancreas. In type 1 diabetes, you notice the islet is destroyed by an inflammatory cell infiltrate, a cellular infiltrate, and the beta cells disappear. The same thing happens in type 2 diabetes, but this time the infiltrate is amyloid. But you get the same end result with amyloid or with immune infiltration that you lose beta cells. So under those circumstances, what we wanted to do was a tall order to try and regenerate. So I thought one of the best things I could do when I first came to the United States was to go up to Toronto to the Banting Institute. And I, uh, there you see Banting and Bess, young Banting on the left, the, the biochemist and Bess, uh, the orthopedic surgeon, uh, with the dog Marjorie. And they asked me, why did I want to do that? So I said, it was very simple. I want to go and stand in that exact spot where Marjorie stood. And I want to see if I get divine inspiration as to how I'm going to cure this problem with Banting. So I went and stood in that exact spot and after a few minutes, I felt this warm trickle down my leg. So unfortunately, I stood too close to Marjorie. And so now we say, what are the chances that occurred that gave us this opportunity? I had a fellow from the University of Michigan, kind of from the uh, University uh, uh, at McGill in Montreal, uh, Lawrence Rosenberg. He said, you know, Dr. Billy, you did all these studies in Cape Town. South Africa on pancreatitis. And so you were interested in why, when you started the process, say you had a drink or two, and you started damaging the pancreas, the process went on and on and on. So why can't we develop an animal model in which the process will not keep going, and uh, 
and, that, uh, and we'll find a ways of combating the effects of the initial assault on the pancreas. So I said, that sounds like a wonderful idea. So we got pancreases, and we uh, wrapped them over here with saran. And because that's like we go back kid, trying to induce kidney damage. So we wrapped them with saran to see if we could induce pancreatitis, and then we could have an animal model to be able to show how we could stop the whole process. So after six months, he turned around to me and he said to me, you know, I'm going back to uh, McGill, to <coughs> Canada. He said, nothing has happened. And, uh, uh, we have, and I want to stop my fellowship and I'm leaving. So I said, well, before you leave, let's uncap the lenses and let's have a look down the microscope. So we looked down the microscope and lo and behold, there was no evidence of inflammation at all. But what there was, was a whole bunch of new islands, just from Saran. So, so I said to him, Rosenberg, I want to tell you something. When you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> because we wanted to work on pancreatitis, nobody wanted to hear, except the people in Marseille and in Cape Town. But over here, we'll, the whole world will get our attention because we can make new islands. So the material Saran, in South Africa and in England, it's called cellophane. And we were wrapping in cellophane. When we came here, we discovered that saran in the United States is the same as cellophane. But however, there's not such a nice word to describe the process when we wanted to call it cellophane dipping. <laughs> so we call it saran. And that is, of course, the discovery that was made based upon this observation. Saran dipping, wrapping the pancreas and inducing iron regeneration. We created a crude extract of the pancreas and we call it iotropin to move an iron to grow. And a crude pancreatic extract from cellophane wrapped pancreases was shown to induce new iron formation in other animals. So we now knew we had a wonderful process in which we probably had something in this mix from the iron that was doing this. We try to copyright and patent that mix, of course, and we are told, go home and until you've got a pure protein or a gene, and then we'll talk to you about that. Now, others, and you'll remember the days, I'm sure, uh, that when we wanted to know what a pituitary did in the human, what did we do in the animal model? We chopped it out, we cut it out, right? And then we saw that the animal didn't grow, so we knew there was a growth factor that came from the pituitary. Or if we want to know what the testis did, we cut the testis out and we saw that this beautiful cock that distinguishes the male from the female, the comb, disappeared. And now we knew that the testis was making something that made men look so beautiful with this beautiful comb. Oh, not, you know, that unfortunately, women didn't require one of the female species. Now, that's how we learned endocrinology. So how were we going to find out what was happening here in this whole process that are happening? So we created Siamese twins. We wrapped this one's pancreas, we didn't touch this one, and nothing happened to the one that had the rat pancreas. But the one that didn't have the rat pancreas went on to become diabetic and was not killed. So what did we know? We didn't have a hormone. But the hormone is made in one place, transported across the blood stream, to act on another out of place. So now we knew we must focus our attention on what was happening in the rat pancreas. We did that. And we found that iotropin would reverse scriptures of toxin induced diabetes. We were also disappointed because we were told, go and find the gene. So at that point in time, I went and recruited a number of wonderful people, uh, like Renette Ray, Rafaelov, and Scott Barlow, uh, to work on the messages that were present in the regenerating pancreas. And that led to the discovery of INGA, an, an MRA differential display. So we had to develop the methodology to address the issue if we wanted. Now, you see the slide that I'm showing you? That's 15 years of work. My wife used to say to me, you go to work every day, and it's so exciting, but something wonderful happens. I said, darling, you don't know what I do. <laughs> but uh, sometimes you've got to slog and slog and slog for it until it actually happens. Right? But you've got to keep your nose to the grindstone. These are the people that did this with me. Dr. Pittenger passed away this last year. Uh, René Trofailov, who initiated the gene studies, the differential display, and Scott Barlow over here, who actually cloned and sequenced the gene in GAT over here. And that's yours truly in younger days. All right, so now we've uh, learned about this little background process. So what did this gene look like? It was huge, 766 base pairs. 
and we wanted to produce not uh, a, a, a large piece like that to start our clinical studies, but rather a smaller construct that we thought we could work with. Once we had this construct, which is a lot smaller than the 766 base pairs, we said, could we reproduce what happened with wrapping, the serendipity I told you about? So we asked another question. Does recombinant in gap? Can you see out back? And you can hear me out back? Yep. Okay. Good auditorium to work. Stimulate pancreatic ductal cell proliferation. Why were we interested in the ducts? Because everything we did with Inga on a mature beta cell did nothing to it. So we knew whatever was happening with those new islands, they were coming from a precursor, probably differentiated stem cell. So where do the stem cells reside in the pancreas? In the ductal system, the drainage system. So we went back to look at what happened with the drainage system. And then can the activity of iotrope, you remember the crude extract? We made antibodies to INGAP and wanted to see if the antibodies to INGAP would neutralize the effect of iotrope, meaning that INGAP was present in that gamish that we had as iotrope. And does it stimulate the formation of new islets? And does recombinant INGAP reverse diabetes induced by streptococcus in hamsters? 1997, we cloned and sequenced the INGAP. But it took three years to show all that. Another single slide. It's nice when your whole life could be summarized in two slides. <laughs> Not the wonderful introduction Dr. Childress gave me. So then we said, let's try and get lucky again. We said, if it's going to work, we want a small peptide. And we looked at the molecule to say, is any part of this likely to be the biological core? And lo and behold, we found this little piece here, 15 amino acids, that's all. And that became Ingap peptide. We went from that into the situation where I said, can it do what we hope it will do? So when you start off giving NGAP peptides to normal animals, this is what you find. There's a duct. Coming off the duct very nicely is a new island. So we're getting transformation of ductal cell into islands. Then we said, well, we want not only the island to make insulin, we'd like it to make all the hormones that occur in an island. For those of you who understand diabetes, you know, it's not an absolute deficiency of insulin alone. It's also aberrations in glucagon secretion, somatostatin secretion, other things. So here you see this islet grows and matures and it's staying for insulin. There it's got a very nice insulin core. Here it's got a glucagon core. And this is how it starts. It starts like this. In the duct over here, you give in gap and you start seeing new cells that contain insulin in the walls of the duct that will proliferate to form this whole new island. So we were delighted. We were ecstatic. We thought we've done it. We've proven that we were the heretics, but it can be done. You can actually get islands to trunk, uh, duct cells to trunk, form into, uh, into islet cells. So does it work in the animal model? And here I'll show you the first time back in 2004 with Lawrence Rosenberg in the Animals of Surgery. That if you take animals and you give them streptococcus and you make them diabetic, the blood sugars run 400. If you give them INGAP and then follow them for the next 30 days, their blood sugar returns to normal. What's even better than that? Stop the INGAP and look what happened. They stay normal. What have you done? You haven't given them a drug that just lowers blood sugar. You've given something that's changed the whole biology of the animal. And what we showed you was we regenerated new pancreatic islands. And that was the process. Of course, that's not the end of the story. It's not the only part of the story. So what uh, goes on next is, what happened in these animals that were diabetic? If I take a healthy animal, here's a nice big juicy island, and I treat that animal with streptococcus, here's a very sick island with a cellular infiltrate. Then I give NGAP to this sick animal over here, and look, here comes a new island. But you notice what else happens? the inflammatory infiltrate recipients. When I give you a new healthy island, what happens is all the proteins that were leaking, that were inducing an inflammatory response, also disappear. So we were getting two bites of this cherry, just because we have made new healthy cells grow again. And so this is what had happened. So now we're going to ask, uh, uh, what would happen if we then created transgenic animals that overexpressed anger, either in their beta cell, that's the insulin-producing cell, 
or in the glucagon cell, that's the glucagon producing cell, or in the acid of tissue, the tissue that makes enzymes like amylase, lipase, and trypsin. And lo and behold, if we use the uh, enzyme portion of the, uh, uh, in, uh, of the pancreas to overexpress INGAP in acid of tissue, driven by the EP elastase promoter, if we took control animals, we gave them strip of the toxin, 140 milligrams per kilo, we made them diabetic. We could not make the EP animals diabetic. We gave them the equivalent of the vaccination. They, we couldn't make them diabetic. So isn't this a nice situation that they now had enough islands over here so that they could combat any assault on their pancreas like the strip of the toxin? And we thought this was wonderful. But of course, we were worried about the elephant in the room. What was the elephant? The elephant was maybe we'll take a mouse, a hamster, a rat, a rabbit, a dog, a monkey, and transform it into the cell so that they would get a malignancy. And we really wanted to know that we weren't going to create new malignancies. So that's what we did here, too. And then David Taylor Fishwick in the lab did the following. And he's looking at accelerating factors or ingap inducers, such as AP1 activators, SAT activators, and PAN activators here, and uh, stimulating now the expression of ingap, and here's the expression of ingap, and that now addresses the issue of the asthma cell, and the asthma cell can grow and proliferate, and you get islands coming out of the hat here, like a magician, <laughs> over here, but you worry that those islands may transform into malignant cells, and here are the new islands, expressing a transcription factor, PDX, which you need for the growth of new islands. And this is what's so interesting. PDX feeds back and binds to the promoter region of Inga and turns it off. So this is what it looks like when you've done that. It turns all this off so that once you reach a level that it combats the diabetes, you don't go on with the proliferation. Isn't that neat? So some of us think we may actually have an approach to managing certain pancreatic cancers too when we start looking at the other side of this coin. So for me, that was exciting, but everybody says, so what? You do this in hamsters, you do it in dogs, you do it in rabbits, and you do it in mice, and you do it in monkeys. But man is different. So first show us you can do it in man, then we'll start believing it. Remember, we were the heritage. Nobody believed you ever could do this. And everybody, all the naysayers wanted to say no. All right, so you did it in a few animals, we don't do it, right? So then we uh, started clinical studies with uh, Inga, and in the clinical studies, hemoglobin A1C responded to ingap in type 1 diabetics with a close to 1% reduction. Today, the FDA decrees that you need a 0.6% reduction in hemoglobin A1C, and you've got a drug that is approvable for the management of diabetes. We did better than that. And it persisted for a little while, but we didn't do further studies. That's type 1 diabetes now, in which there's a 98% loss of pancreatic beta cells. What about type 2 diabetes? In type 2 diabetes, we found we got about a 0.6 to 0.8% reduction with INGAP as well, and the effect persisted. So now we knew you could do it in humans. We measured C-peptide, which is an indirect measure of the ability to make insulin. And it reappeared when it had been disappeared all this time. So we knew that we were, it was, we were growing new fresh islands capable of doing that. Where are we now with this whole process? We are in clinical trials but there's another new element. And you can guess what the element is. And the new element is this, is when you initiate the process of islet neogenesis, you take quiescent duct cells, and you stimulate the duct cells with INGAP or EGF gastrin, most recent uh, paper just reported a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in science was beta trophin, and then you initiate this process. Then you transdifferentiate these ductal cells into adult forms of endocrine cells, and they go on to proliferate and increase. And then there's a new process that emerges, and that is the process of apoptosis, harikiri or programmed cell death. So in a person who has autoimmune disease, like type 1 diabetes, they will, of course, go on and knock off all these good islands that you're making. So you've got to stop that process. You've got to stop the killing. Why are you stimulating the growth? And you have to tackle the process in a dual way. And this is basically the anti-apoptotic studies we're looking at for the new islets include drugs such as glutazone's GLP-1 analogs, and uh, I have to tell you, an anti-inflammatory agent. 
And then what we hoped to do is take this process and simulate it, and at the same time, slow down the killer. So where are we with that now? So we were very fortunate at this point in time that um, we recruited to uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School from the University of Virginia, Dr. Nadler. And Dr. Nadler wanted to test Inga in his animal model, which is a, a very, a, a, an animal model, an NOD mouse that gets 100% of diabetes if you wait long enough. And he wanted to use an anti-inflammatory agent, lysophylline, and INGAP alone, and lysophylline plus INGAP. In other words, stop the killing, stimulate the growth, and see what he can do. Remember that the NOD mouse develops an intense autoimmune reaction and destroys virtually all its items. And here's the effect on the rate of remission. Uh, Lysophylline alone did nothing. INGAP, about a 10% remained in the animal model he was using. Now, if he added INGAP and Lysophylline, he was getting about a 40% remission. And if he pre-treated first and used the combination, he got a 77% remission rate in the NOD mouse, the highest that's ever been shown. And that's the collaboration between UVA and Eastern Virginia Medical School, quite by accident. I was working at the EBMS making Inga, and he was working here, working on Lazarus And we put the two together. And that's what happens. So don't judge people necessarily on what they've achieved in life, but judge them on how good their collaborators are. Okay? And who, who will work with them. So 10 current trends in diabetes uh, in the USB changed. And my daddy told me back, you remember my daddy who wouldn't let me finish uh, uh, becoming a basic scientist and I first had to become a clinician? Can current trends in the United States be changed? The only way to really stay out of trouble is to avoid it, my daddy. But he used to have negative attitudes about things and I used to have very strong positive attitudes. So I wanted to turn my attention to uh, another cell that I was told never regenerated, and that is the nerve cells. And I started working with the Women's Health and Aging Study and the Health ABC Study with Elaine Resnick. And we looked at the potential role of neuropathy in the de development of disability of old age. Diabetic neuropathy with functional neurologic deficits, with age decrements in peripheral nerve function, reduced strength, diminished position sense, impairment, inability to stand up from a chair, reduced walking ability, reduced walking speed, and then inability to fulfill the activities of daily living, and today I want to tell you that the, if you are getting on with diabetes and you get to the age of 65, you get it to fall at least once in a year, and one in three people will fall. But if you have over the age of 65 and you have a combination of age plus diabetes, then your risk is 17-fold greater. This is the commonest cause of traumatic brain injury today. It's a fall. Everybody tells you that a fracture is caused by a Z-score on measuring bone density. There's no such thing. A Z-score will not kill you. But having neuropathy and instability and attacks will kill you. So I wanted to start working on that issue of could we do something about this. So over 65, 58% of people have large fiber neuropathy. And it's worse with diabetes, greatly accelerated if you get over the age of 85. Diabetes, neuropathy, and old age. Old age worsens walking speed, static balance, dynamic balance, and coordination. Interventions should be aimed at reducing diabetes-associated disability. You know, it's funny when we said that, okay? The first time we said it was in 2001. Then we said it again in 2002. Then we said it again in 2000. Now there's a center, Bicori, Patient-Centered Oriented Research Institute, to do for patients what they want to have done for themselves. And they say, we want to stop falling. Can you stop us falling? And so we said, well, it's about time we listen. This is now 30 years later. Done. We listened to them and did something about that. So with a little extra effort, you have an old maid, plus a little bit of exercise, and you get a hot mama. And we thought maybe that's the way we needed to go. We also thought, I don't know if you can read, but I've got to share some of the things on this. Can you see it up there? Yeah. I can see what's of it. Right on top, walking. It is well documented that for every minute that you exercise, you add one minute to your life. This enables you at age 55 to spend an additional five months in a nursing home at $5,000 a month. <laughs> and this is me. I said the only reason I would take up exercising so that I could hear heavy breathing again. This is my grandmother. She started walking 
five miles a day when she was 60. Now she's 97, and we don't know where she is. Uh, I'd say, I have to exercise early in the morning before my brain figures out what I'm trying to do. I joined a health club last year, spent 400 bucks, I haven't lost a pound, apparently you have to show up. And then there are a number of other messages there too. Uh, I have to say, uh, and last but not least, I don't exercise because it makes the ice jump right out of my glass when I start exercising. But I, I can't handle that. But the idea was for us that we would start exercise programs. But what I've learned in the 13 years, that exercise is a, the, it's a rude word. It's a word people don't like. I mean, I see all the kids like you running around the campus over here. I think that's terrific. We go and talk to older diabetics and say, we want you to start an exercise program. And they say, what? What did you say? I say, what do you mean by exercise? So they won't do that. So we have to say, can we do anything that's a lot simpler? So I've shown you cell biology, I've shown you protein chemistry, I've shown you molecular biology, I've shown you gene therapy, I've shown you all that. So the Helen Resnick, working at the National Institute of Aging, said, we need an easy way to find the people who've got neuropathy as they get older. Can you give us a simple one? And none of your fancy stuff that you do in the lab. We want just a simple one. Very simple one. So we said two-minute walk, now that didn't distinguish them. Foot tapping, it didn't distinguish them. Balance walk, didn't distinguish them. And then we found that. 90 is test, right? How long can you stand on one leg? Don't try it afterwards. Don't try it in there. But afterwards, you're going to try it. So what I'm telling you is we, we, we cycle around again to find out what's important to a clinician. You know, they'll tell you they can't take the shoes and socks off. But I get people to take the shoes and socks off when they come into my clinic, and then I say, stand on one leg. And they do that. And if they can stand on one leg for 30 seconds, they don't have the rock. Isn't that a nice place to be? For years now, we've been using the drug metformin to treat our needs. It's a wonderful drug, but it makes you vitamin B12 deficient. And if it makes you vitamin B12 deficient, you can't stand on one leg. And you get neuropathy and you'll fall. It's very easy to replace. Just get them to stand on one leg. Now, come practice that. It's terrific. I keep practicing that so I can win some. So the, the traditional risk factors, age, diabetes, smoking, and alcohol use for peripheral nerve dysfunction, B12 deficiency. That was another one of the discoveries that came from the type of work we did, is to measure their B12 levels and their vitamin D and show they were deficient. And dyslipidemia. Decreased bone mass, decreased muscle mass, decreased muscle strength, and physical decline, which gave rise to decreased physical function and disability. So aging, disease, and falls. How were we going to trick these people, these nice people, who were our patients, into actually doing the things we wanted to do. We said, well, we're not going to tell them we're going to exercise them. All we're going to tell them is that we're going to increase their mobility. We are going to motivate them to move. We're going to do balance training for them. So does this work in effect? So this is what we were trying to do. Find out all the causes of why people fell. And they range from vestibular dysfunction, impairment of vision, loss of sensation, weakness, how we have Cognitive decline, loss of balance, respiratory, cardiorespiratory insufficiency. But one of the commonest ones today is polypharmacy. When you go out into the world and start this crime, the average diabetic takes 12 pills. 12 pills. A lot of them to help them with their mood and give them mood elevation. A lot of them cognitively impair their function. Then they start making very bad decisions with their insulin dose and the oral hypoglycemic dose. So we knew we had, we wanted to get everybody to be able to skateboard. You see this? is one of my patients on a skateboard. <laughs> so we do very simple measures. We measure postural sway. I, I, you know, so people say, oh, is that important? I'll show you, it's very important. Because if you take a person with diabetes, and I've had the experience myself personally, not me personally. My late uh, mother-in-law uh, was standing outside a store with me, and I went inside to the sword to buy some athletic equipment. I said, what do you say? Right here. You don't move. Stand right there. I'm just getting the sword. I'll be out in a minute. Came back a minute later, there was an ambulance. Picked up from the floor. I said, well, what happened? She says, I felt myself going. And I couldn't stop myself. And I fell out of bang my head. That's what actually happened. So I learned that if you can't do this, you see, control your sway, your over sway, and you don't have the writing techniques, you don't fall. And then you're going to bang your head. 40% of the patients who fell 
in Virginia had traumatic brain injuries. Right? Okay. So falls rate. So we do this, we measure reaction time, postural sway, lower limb strength, and proprioception. And we do this too with lower limb strength. We show you that if you start losing the ability to dorsiflex, to do this with your big toe, you're going to fall. Because you're going to trip. You'll trip on the carpet, you'll trip uh, on a tile, you'll trip from going to the bathroom. If you have the visual disturbance, you don't see when you go to the bathroom, you fall into the bathroom as well. So could we do anything? And so we did this very nice reduction of force roots with strength and balance strength. Did you hear the word exercise? No, we don't, we don't want to do that. Not that thing today. So we increase quadriceps strength, we improve sensation, we decrease postural sway, and we change the reaction time. Do you know that oftentimes when you say to the person, they're driving the car, and why did you just go through that red light and you hit that person? You say, well, I saw the red light, but I just couldn't quite put my foot on the brake fast enough. That's reaction time. And that's what slows down as we get older. Isn't it nice that we can get it back to you again just with a little exercise like this? A little motivation to move. A little balance training. And here's the other thing that's so nice. If we measured reaction time, on the hand it improved as well as the foot, uh, so that you could get improvement not only in diabetics, but in normal people who thought their reaction times were good. You could do that as well. And that was beautiful. And here's the sway. You see the healthy controls shown here in the, uh, in the yellow? Can you see that? The sway. Do you see what this is in a type 2 diabetic with neuropathy? They sway like this. So we put them through this training, and lo and behold, of this training, this is what happened. Do you see that? We stopped them swaying. You ever watch the people who walk into your clinic? You will in future. Watch when they walk in, and you can tell the neuropath that they're walking like that. Right? Why can I imitate my patient so well? <laughs> <laughs> so then there's the small fiber neuropathy, the damage to these little nerve fibers. This is the story of bees stinging my feet. Feet feeling as if I felt walking around on hot coals. And this over here, they get pain, which is burning, superficial allodynia, which means they interpret a non-painful stimulus as painful. Earlier on, they're hyperesthetic and hyperalgesic. They're dependent of neurovascular function. Later on, they get damaged. This person only has normal strength, normal reflexes, and normal nerve production. So when we first described this syndrome, we were told, you're, you're heretics again. So we said, yeah, no, it does occur. So the neurologist said to us, are there is a neurologist in there? Nobody will face that. OK, so the neurologist said to us, if we can't measure it with nerve conduction, then it's not there. It's in the head. So these people are hysterics. So we found, no, we had to do something else. We, we, we started biopsying the skin to look at these little nerves. And we used antibodies to PG9.5. The person who has Gary Pittinger, who I showed you, who passed away this last year. And we found these beautiful little intraepidermal nerve fibers in the skin. And then we looked at healthy controls, and there the nerve fibers. And we looked at people with diabetes, and you notice they're all gone. And then we looked at metabolic syndrome. There are 28.9 million diabetics in the United States today. There are 77 million people with pre-diabetes in the United States. And half of them have this as a problem. So that's the future. The future is impaired glucose tolerance. It's a metabolic syndrome, and they're going to get the same disease, and we're going to do something about it. So wouldn't it be nice if we could regenerate those nerves, make them grow back like we made the eyelids grow back? So of course, this is what we'd like to see. You see these little nerve fibers going up into the skin? They are C fibers, important for warm thermal perception, important for pain perception. And here you see them going up into the skin. And then what happens if you develop metabolic syndrome, or impaired glucose tolerance, or diabetes? You see how they die back? So wouldn't it be nice if we could make them just grow back again? So, and once again, you keep your eyes open. I had patients who had, were put on the anti-epileptic drug, topiramate, and they said, we can feel again. And I said, no, you can't. They said, yes, we can feel. So you put us on that drug, uh, we can feel. So we can tell hot now, we can tell cold now, and all the things were coming back. So we said, that's phenomenal. Do you mind if we buy up to you again? So I said, no, by ourselves, because if you can show this happens, the whole world needs to know about this, right? That you can regenerate nerves. 
and he has regeneration. And I'll show you that it's real. Here's a before topiramate, the antiepileptic crap, and here is after 20 weeks of topiramate. They're all the nerves back again. And that person can feel again. Okay? So we've done lots of studies now to show that that's really true. So the two radical things I started out to tell you about. We've achieved iron regeneration from proto-differentiated stem cells. And we've regenerated nerves. So that's a lovely place to be. And we stop people falling, and that's good. I just want to show you quickly, too, the autonomic nervous system. And uh, for me, this has become very important. I spoke about this at endocrine uh, um, grand rounds yesterday. But the sympathetic and parasympathetic become very important. And your brain, in regulating your heart contraction, the rate of contraction, the force of contraction, is going to become incredibly important to us today, to stay in a state of equilibrium. So let us look at this, the autonomic nerve dysfunction, the crystal ball of cardiovascular disease and brittle value. And here is my little crystal ball, showing you that if you look at the effects of intensive glycemic control, glucose control, in the three major studies that you as the taxpayer paid millions of dollars to show that intensive glycemic control reduced heart attacks, strokes, peripheral vascular disease, and revascularization. None of this happened. But however, what did happen was there was a 22% increase in sudden death, in sudden death in the accord study. Right. So the sudden death is now shown to be related to autonomic dysfunction. If you have cardiac autonomic neuropathy, you have a 1.5 to 2.14 times likely to die to come if you are individuals without this. The cardiac autonomic neuropathy in the presence of distal symmetric polyneuropathy, the sudden death rate is threefold in. If I take less of your peripheral sensation, if you've got numb feet, your risk is 4.33. So as some people heard me say, when I used to start my teaching career in Cape Town many years ago, I used to teach the students, if you know syphilis, you will know the whole of anything. Then we did a good job of eradicating syphilis for most part. So now I teach them, no autonomic neuropathy, you'll know the whole of it. It affects every system in the body. So we can you know, take a leap out, uh, out of the book. So here is, just in case you think, uh, you know, it's a tall story, 15 studies, Radian, Mason, and I analyzed. One out of the 15 didn't show that there was an increased risk. But 14 out of the 15 showed that if you had one abnormality in autonomic function, you had doubled your risk of dying. And if you had two abnormalities, you had more than three and a half fold increased risk of dying if you had autonomic dysfunction. But Woody Allen said sudden death isn't so bad. Anyone who spent an evening with an insurance salesman knows this. All right. So me, my philosophy is perfectly simple. If I'm going to go, I'm going to go like that. Just one hand, yeah, extend off. Okay, there's good. No drooling, no spitting, no you know, incontinence, none of that stuff. I don't want any of that. I just want to go, boom, like that. Okay. So I know there are ways of getting me to do that, but I'm not asking you to do that. Okay. So. What is happening now with the autonomic dysfunction is really interesting. What's happening is the following, that you have hypothalamic dopaminergic tone, which is decreased if you're obese and diabetic. And that loss of hypothalamic tone activates the sympathetic nervous system and causes all the metabolic side effects. If I give you one morning dose of a drug bromocryptine, and the person who made bromocryptine fade, uh, fade so that, is Michael Thorner. Okay, Michael Thorner. And he was the first person to show that you could shrink the pituitary tumor within three days by giving bromo protein. We were using it for a completely different thing now. We wanted to affect dopamine metabolism. And we did. So we restored the peak, we restored sympathetic activity, and this just shows you we got a 51% reduction within one year of cardiovascular events and mortality. Now that's a nice place to be. To take a drug that has been used for 30 to 40 years to suppress the pituitary and find that it does another very good thing. Take old drug, new discovery. Okay, so what Dylan Thomas uh, said back in 51, uh, <clears throat> do not go gentle into that good night. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. The wise men at their end, no dark is right, because their words had fought. No lightning, they do, do not go gentle into that night. So, of course, I'm sharing you the full lightning and the things that have happened in my life as a physician scientist. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright, 
Their, fall, their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight, and though too late, they grieved it on its way. Do not go to, into that night. Grave men near death, to see with blinding sight, blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sand height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. My father did me a service, didn't you? He made me a curse. He made me understand people. He made me understand how to interact with people. And then I went back to the bank. And I did all the basic science. And I cycled back into the bank. So I epitomize today translational medicine. This is what I do. I go to the bench, to the clinic, from the clinic back to the bench, to do that type of thing. And that's what's so exciting. Do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage, it is the dying of the night. And I told you in the last minute or two that this is what you do in life. I was here, this is, uh, you may not know, the Victoria Falls, the river, there's the Zambezi River, it's full of crocodiles. So I was dead to see if I could get on my windsurfer and sail across. And then dodge all the crocodiles. That's little me there. You see that? All right. I'm an old man and have known many troubles, but most of them never happened. <laughs> so I just want to thank you. You quoted right when you said Yogi Barrow said that. Uh, as our good friend Yogi would say, the future ain't what it used to be. It is difficult to predict anything, especially the future. What was heretical 20 years ago is now traditional. Regenerating nerves, regenerating medicine, it's traditional. We fought like hell for 20 years to get people to believe it. But it's been an exciting journey to do all these things. So remember I started off with this, let us see how high we can fly before the sun melts the wax in our wings. Deedless, Icarus, avoid the sun. No, you mustn't do that. You must take on every challenge for you. There's so much excitement in it. So you need a partner, and I'll finish off right now, is uh, Edna Billick is my partner in life. She's my wife, but also she runs the education division, and now two of the fellows programs at East Virginia Medical School. We took 10 years and we developed a sensitive, specific quality of life inventory for peripheral neuropathy, which was translated into uh, German, and now it's been translated into 41 different languages. The FDA have decreed that it is the endpoint that you need to use if you do a neuropathy study. It's used all over the world in all these different languages, and it's been a, a really exciting journey. When we first came out and developed a questionnaire, my school, Eastern Virginia Medical School, owns the tool. They licensed it the first time for $65,000. Now we've got 40 languages, and they charge $1,500 per language plus $20,000. So they made millions out of asking the right questions. What you're going to learn in life is it's not so easy to ask the right questions. It's very difficult to ask the right questions. It's very difficult to use the right word. If you have time and you want to ask me, I'll tell you about differences in English spoken in different parts of the world. It's very different, okay? So here I want to say, do not go where the path may lead. Thank you very much for quoting that. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Nobody had to develop a tool for in your own, just to ask the questions. And that's the tool that we'll develop. It's an awful quality of life. So we were in Sendai in Japan, and we saw this beautiful statue. And so that's not us on the top over there. That's us, <laughs> that's us down below. That's my wife, Etta, and me. And I, I want you to pay tribute to my lifetime partner. Uh, we started courting when I was a first-year medical student. Then we got engaged, got married when I was a second-year medical student. We have three children. This is one of our grandchildren. We're gallivating grandparents now. We would like to do things like this. This is Sherry Colbert, who's done all the physical training and exercise studies with us, and we dance our diabetes with Sherry Colbert. And these are the people uh, at Eastern Virginia Medical School in the Diabetes Center who've made it possible for me to come and talk to you today, and I feel very honored that I have been asked. I want to tell you they're not the only people. Uh, I have a little cottage at the Outer Banks where I go windsurfing, and then came Hurricane Irene, did a lot of damage. And, uh, but I never give up. You see this over here? This uh, Pomeranian with the front? <laughs> Just never give up. Sometimes it takes 10 years to develop. I told you 15 years for the one thing under there. You just, just keep going. I have a lot of people to thank. These are my mentors and collaborators. 
These are my trainees uh, from all over the world. And uh, uh, I want to thank them all for giving me the wherewithal to be here on this podium to share with you the excitement of being a physician scientist. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. This was fascinating and rich, and we got a lot done in an hour. Um, we have time for just a couple of questions and comments, um, and I will bring you the mic. Please uh, identify yourself. Hi, I'm Jonathan Truitt, a pulmonologist. In your studies with NGAP, can you talk about were there any changes in obesity and the patterns of obesity? I, I'd love to tell you that. I can tell you in the clinical studies in type 2 diabetes that uh, INGAP did nothing to body weight, nothing to BMI, nothing to waist circumference either. But we don't know for sure because the studies were short. Uh, we don't know what would happen if it was used for a longer time. Uh, now, I think you're asking a wonderful question because INGAP does a lot of other things. Certainly, uh, what a very nice study done <coughs> at McGill shows that it stimulates the outgrowth um, of neuronal cells from dorsal ganglia, so we now know it targets uh, nerve cells as well, and we now know that probably acting uh, maybe through the left and it's actually on the hypothalamus as well. So it has a lot of other effects. It comes from a family, it comes from the rake family, and the rake uh, people think uh, we, we come to see what's called IGA, but the uh, rake family includes rake 3 delta, which has got a lot of similarities, which has receptors throughout the body. So if it cross-reacts with those receptors, we'll find that it may do a lot more. You must one day, you must text me and tell me why you're so interested in that. I'd love to hear it now. Another question? I'll ask you one. Um, if you were just starting out now in 2013 on this career that would then extend well on into the 21st century, what are the things that you would be looking for, and what are the things in the environment that you think now you would need to watch out for? Uh, okay, so you did ask one question. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, I, I have a very strong feeling to go back to what I did back in Cape Town. In Cape Town, when I, went, when I was an epidemiologist starting my research career, I used to go to all you know, the uh, townships at, uh, on Sunday mornings at 4 or 5 o'clock, and then go and wake the people up. And then I would test them to see what their blood sugar was, and I'd come back an hour later after I'd given them sugar to see. So we were the people that first identified the fact that the uh, Indians living in South Africa, the Indians living in South one third of them were like So that was an observation carried out by going into the community, addressing an issue in the community that hadn't been done, and, and that we could bring back to work with. Uh, what happened is we learned that the Indians in Southern Africa at that time had the prerogative, a man had the prerogative to marry his brother's daughter. So they were sitting with skin around the Indians, but that it proliferated. So what happened after we did that is all the Indians dispersed. They went around the country. They said, we've got to go find other girls. We can't do this. I mean, we, we need to widen our team pool. Now my cycle is back again. Because uh, with the advent of this, uh, these, the work we've done, all these years on falls and fractures. I want to do only one thing. I want to go into the community and I want to go and help people learn how they can stop falling, stop fracturing, stop traumatic brain, brain injuries. We showed it in the, in the laboratory. Now my laboratory has to be bigger. And so we put in two PCORI grants and we're going to put another one in to say that we're going to start off here in Virginia and then exactly as we did with our quality of life tool. That quality of life tool that we developed over here went to Romania. Uh, Edna and I have been invited to remain the next month to go there. They sampled 17,000 Romanians and found 5,000 people who had neuropathy, just answering the question. One third of their population. And then they started them on a treatment, which is a cocktail, also copyrighted and patented by us, at least in Virginia Medical School. And now these people have the cameras, and they don't have pain, and they don't have illness, and they don't have tingling. So I'd like to do that too. That's the sort of thing. So it's not because I don't want to carry on and do the molecular biology and the protein chemistry and so forth. We're still doing it in different ways, in nerves and in, in islands. But I want to go out in the community, the wider community. So I want to do the most for the most people. I think this is interesting. I mean, you do 
span the whole cells to society uh, spectrum, but it also connects very powerfully with our medical center hour next week. We have the um, state health commissioner, Dr. Cynthia Romero, coming to talk about creating healthy communities. So I think you and Dr. Romero both will be powerful and inspiring figures for us. So thank you very much, and we hope that all of you will be back for next week's Medical Center Hour.